Salam and peace. This is Imam Malik Mujahid, and uh, you're watching Muslim Network TV. We are always there 24 7 on Galaxy 19 satellite, which covers the United States, Canada, and Mexico, south to north, east to west, as well as OTT devices like Apple TV, Amazon Fire TV, Roku. Uh, you can download our app if you like. Uh, why don't you do that? And uh, also, uh, our website is muslimnetwork.tv, and you will have all this information available there as well. And if you are one of those people who will see everything in the universe through YouTube, uh, our channel is available there as well. And once you are there, do ensure that you subscribe. You know, this morning when I started reading papers and uh, I saw congressperson after congressperson standing up and sharing with people what they went through. And that probably prompted because uh, um, AOC shared on Instagram her story, which uh, some other congressperson ended up denying, oh, she was not even present. So uh, in the in the capital when it all happens, and they, so so it seems that all the facts, whatever happened on January sixth, on the Capitol Hill, is already subject to debate, subject to different memories, and subject to uh, what is correct, what is incorrect. I hope they will do a good job in properly investigating it and documenting the history. I mean, this is uh, not something like 9-11 in which 10, 12 people uh, came to the country from somewhere else and uh, enjoyed life a little bit in bars and womanizing and then perished with those planes. This thing was extremely well documented by the mainstream media, participants themselves, and there were citizen journalists uh, who are not connected with the mainstream media, but they were documenting it. And once uh, they have done uh, their documentation, uh, they placed it, sold it to mainstream, uh, who are, whoever is willing to buy and put it on YouTube to make a little pennies there. And YouTube, now the same people who are sleeping before all of this happened, or not checking anything, suddenly came in the very high gear, stopped every, each and everything, including the independent media and journalists. One of those leading journalists who uh, was part of observing the whole thing through his camera lens is Ford Fisher, and he's going to be with us today. Welcome to Muslim Network TV. Thank you for having me on. Ford Fisher is an independent uh, news videographer, editor, filmmaker, and he launched his own company and he's editor in chief of News to Share. And his work has been included in four Emmy winning films. Uh, so he just goes around doing this job. So tell me, uh, it is now almost a month uh, when all these things happen. Is this memory still fresh for you? Yeah, I mean, when situations like this happen, uh, there are basically um, tons of news outlets that then rush to struggle to understand what happened, that they they analyze it, they want time codes of individual shots and so forth. And so for the last month, uh, I've been basically <laughs> juggling various media requests for video and information, photos, time codes, to try to understand what happened. And so, uh, yes, it is true that I'm an independent journalist and that I work for my own news outlet where I publish directly to my own uh, audience. But at the same time, outlets like CNN, NBC, CBS, BBC, Washington Post, um, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, I could go on, but have all licensed my footage from that to help uh, explain what happened. And so it's been really interesting to see the way that uh, my work has been mixed with both the mainstream medias, uh, but also other independent journalists kind of credited alongside me in order to kind of understand uh, what happened. So uh, I really think of, you know, the content that I publish on the day that something happens almost as a first step. It's the building blocks to the understanding of what happened. How come all this major media, which has licensed your material, 
uh, failed to have their people thoroughly cover it. Yeah, I think that there was a little bit of underestimating of what might go on at the Capitol. I think that a lot of mainstream media was probably very focused on the fact that the president himself was going to be speaking at the event, and more on that in a bit. But um, I don't think that anybody thought that something as severe as what ended up happening could go down. It's worth remembering, and I hope that history doesn't forget, that this was the third of three so-called million MAGA marches in which uh, people came together in Washington, D.C. in November, December, and January in order to basically say that they felt the election was stolen uh, from then-President Trump. And so the first two times brought enormous crowds. Um, the first one was somewhat promoted by uh, then-President Trump. The second one wasn't as much. The third one was the one where President Trump told people, be there and be wild. And uh, I think they certainly were listening to him when he said that. Um, but those first two events had huge numbers, but were mostly peaceful throughout the day and sort of descended into violence at nighttime as you had uh, counter protesters and then some of the more extreme elements of the participants marching around Washington, D.C. afterwards without as much of kind of leadership or a flow and, you know, ending up uh, clashing with each other. I think a lot of mainstream media probably anticipated that January 6th would be somewhat like that, that uh, functionally the Capitol would be, you know, one of the most secure uh, campuses on planet Earth. And so uh, who could possibly imagine that anything could escalate this out of hand? And I think most people probably anticipated you're going to have people who are in the city who are angry when the election is uh, confirmed with Joe Biden as the winner. And so I think people anticipated probably that kind of street violence happening at night. Um, but I think that the, the capital insurrection, the way that it happened, probably took uh, basically everybody by surprise. Were you ready for it? Yeah, I mean, I brought a uh, gas mask. I brought goggles. Uh, I wore a bump cap, which is, to people who don't know, that's like if you take a ball cap, you can kind of line it with something that makes it into sort of a secret helmet. Um, so I, I was fairly prepared. I will say that the element that surprised me, I think that what people... Um, might have what might might have been a little bit of a curveball was I think people were underestimating Trump supporters' intention to go into the Capitol. I thought that it was actually fairly obvious that it that it was very likely that with a large crowd people would try to do that. I thought that there could be conflict with the police. What I was surprised by was that it seemed that law enforcement sincerely was not prepared for this. And so this is one thing that I do think some critics um, since then have kind of gotten wrong, where there has been a criticism that says something like the police went really easy on them or the police let it happen. I think that in the abstract, that might be somewhat true in the sense that I think they just didn't prepare. There weren't, the police were there with barricades, but not set up with riot equipment. Uh, sort of the same way as they would be for any other mass demonstration, you know, tens of thousands of people who are not intent on committing violence. I think that that's what they were basically prepared for, compliant crowd control. Um, they did deploy the National Guard ahead of time, but the National Guard was deployed two days before the event in anticipation of large crowd numbers. And the idea was by having the National Guard, you could facilitate things like traffic control. You can take all of those sorts of duties out of the hands of the police, and therefore the police can be more focused on actually policing. Um, as opposed to, I think that if they had been anticipating that it would turn into a riot-like situation, they wouldn't have deployed the National Guard unarmed to do traffic control. They would have had the National Guard surrounding the Capitol, and then none of this would have happened. So when I saw the police fighting back at the Capitol, it, it wasn't enough numbers, and they didn't have the equipment that they would normally use. I think that the, the single moment that I would say that defines this point for me was there was a, after some people were cleared out of the east entrance, which was where I spent a lot of time, there was a smaller entrance that ended up becoming the focus of some of the protesters' attention. And as they were trying to break in, I saw a police officer try to use zip tie handcuffs, like what would normally tie someone's hands together when you're arresting them. They were trying to use that to tie a door shut. It wasn't working. And then when he realized that it wasn't going to work, he pulled a fire extinguisher out of the wall and opened the door and shot the fire extinguisher at the crowd, which 
I mean, it kind of sucks. It, you know, I choked on it a little bit despite wearing a gas mask, but it's not the same as like tear gas or or like heavy crowd control pepper spray, right? Clearly, this was an improvised moment where he's, he's trying to improvise to use handcuffs to close a door, which didn't work. And he is improvising by using a fire extinguisher as a crowd control agent, which it is not. And so what that shows me is I think there were a lot of police officers who earnestly did try to prevent this from happening, but they went into the situation completely not prepared for what it ended up being. Hmm. Well, we'll come back to it a uh, little more in detail. But uh, how come, uh, you know, while preparing for the show, I went to look at your Twitter account, what you're tweeting and all that. And Twitter has a warning. You cannot even see uh, 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 your tweet until you agree that you're willing to subject to something. Uh, I mean, what does it say? Let me see. Sensitive the content. media <laughs> includes potentially sensitive content. Uh, view or change setting, and then uh, caution, this profile may include potentially sensitive content. We don't see these type of things uh, on uh, New York Times and Washington Post and CNN when the similar type of footage is present. Or the same footage. I mean, the all the networks you just mentioned have all used my footage since January 6th. So what, what gives? Um, so here's the thing. I think that on January, as of my coverage on January 6th, I, of course, did post clips that show violence. Indeed, I mean, people got injured at the Capitol. Some died, although I don't believe that I captured on footage anybody losing their life. Um, but so I kind of understand if Twitter wants to mark individual tweets that show violent situations as as sensitive. I don't really have a problem with somebody saying, you know, I, I'm not sure I want to see that right now. And then they move on or whatever. But I do have a problem with the fact that, yeah, indeed, Twitter has seemingly marked my entire profile according to that issue. And so right now, my entire profile, if you're not logged in and already following me, it's labeled the same way as they would label uh, sort of uh, beyond our rated content, to put it lightly. Um, and the uh, frustrating thing about that is that that includes everything else. If I was to post a link to this broadcast, it would be marked as sensitive. Uh, I licensed to PBS for a documentary called The Black Church, which is about uh, the culture of African-American churches in the United States that I had contributed to. Twitter marked that as potentially sensitive, and that's PBS, right? So I don't like that it's totally just indiscriminately marking everything that I do as sensitive because I covered a situation that was violent, um, and there's no actual recourse. It doesn't tell you that they're doing this. It, I, I only found out because people started pointing out to me how frustrating and difficult it was to actually watch my work, and there's no way to appeal it, and you can't reach out to Twitter about it. Uh, Fox News actually did at, reach them for comment, and they basically just referred them to their policy and sort of reasserted that their policy is correctly applied. But they didn't say anything about me specifically to to justify that action. So, so YouTube and Facebook, uh, along with Twitter, all have dealt in this similar way with uh, your work. Yeah. So, I mean, to give the example of Facebook before we get into YouTube, which has been the big one recently, um, Facebook has improved for me a little bit. And that's because during this year, I've covered a lot of, you know, heavy situations. And so in September, after covering a day in which rival militia groups, there was a black nationalist militia group, a right wing militia group, uh, sort of a local anti-racist militia group. There were several armed factions sort of facing off. Um, I'm grateful that no shots were fired on that day, but people were literally pointing firearms at each other and getting into like fist fights. Um, so it was a violent and scary day, but again, I was covering it in my capacity as a journalist, certainly not participating in any kind of militarized movement. And uh, Facebook, after my day of coverage on that day, removed my entire profile altogether. And uh, I spent about a day uh, speaking out about this, uh, mostly on Twitter, and a lot of um, staff from Facebook actually reached out to me to say, hey, I internally set this as like, please review. And it only took a day for them to fix it. And I actually did receive an email apology for that later. And similarly, there were two uh, incorrect enforcement actions. My account was suspended um, in right after the election, actually. 
And uh, similarly, they were able to fix that uh, within a couple hours. So I give Facebook some level of credit that at least in my particular case, um, they did. They were pretty quickly accountable and fixed the problem in its entirety. Yeah, it seems uh, that 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 seems to be they're improving because Facebook. I have also noticed, you know, sometime when I post something, but mm -hmm. just yesterday, I mean, that uh, uh, military coup in Burma, I posted something uh, about that, which has no video whatsoever. Just the word Burma military coup and uh, detention of Suchi. And this is the same military which committed genocide in Burma. I mean, there is nothing <laughs> in these words. And it, it will not allow me to post. It doesn't uh, comply with our policy. Right. So I spent a few minutes tweaking what word and what link change might work. Finally, is able to work. But, but it seems that, uh, they, you know, we're expecting too much from their artificial intelligence here to be intelligent enough to understand what is harmless and what is harmful. But since you have a video, do they have an algorithm to check what is in the video or they are going by your text? Yeah, so I think that this is a complicated problem to be sure. And I think that as just a criticism of all of the big tech companies, I think that there's an over-reliance on algorithms essentially robots to do the job. I mean, I uh, have pointed out that there's actually a, um, for re returning to YouTube, there's actually a uh, list you can find. There's a guy who tests every single keyword. He uploads videos that have nothing in them, just a black screen, and then describes them in different ways with text in order to analyze what words are YouTube punishing. And uh, Palestine is a term that is inherently demonetized. YouTube inherently believes that that videos that include the word Palestine are likely to be inappropriate in some way. Um, when I was first demonetized- While the video itself is blank, it has nothing in there. Even if there's zero content and it just has a tag, Palestine, as a subject, um, that is a automatically uh, sort of punishable term. And so I had been demonetized in 2019, sort of without explanation by YouTube, and it took seven months of advocacy before they finally admitted that they were wrong and fixed it. At the time that I was demonetized, I had about a thousand videos on my channel, and uh, looking through these demonet like these words that are subjected to automated uh, sort of criticism, I searched through my channel, and out of my thousand or so videos at the time, seventy of them contained the word Palestine. I've covered a lot of activism pertaining to. Uh, the Palestinian conflict with Israel. And uh, so I'm not saying that that's necessarily why I was demonetized in 2019, but I think it's interesting and it's unfortunate uh, because it shows that they're relying on computers and the computers are going to get things wrong, right? I think that it's going. it would cut into these companies' profit margins if they hired more people to actually interact with humans. And that's probably why they don't do it. They'd rather teach a robot uh, how to censor, uh, get it wrong sometimes, than actually cut into their profit margin by having a human being watch the stuff and then make a proper determination. You're watching Muslim Network TV. This is Imam Malik Mujahid, and I'm talking with an independent journalist, Ford Fisher, and we'll be right back after these messages. My name is Adam. You remember me. I appeared in so many episodes that Sound Vision has put on the market. No matter what it oh, no. Hey, what's happening? Hey, oh, sorry. Lockdown is what it is. Well, continuing here, in this lockdown, Sound Vision never stops thinking about you, the viewer. We'll have to get back into production again, online and in line. Everybody in their own space, e even me. Although I'm stuck with Lanisa. Salam! <laughs> Salam! Salam! <laughs> I, know, I know, you were shocked too. Well, l let me continue. Uh, this, is, um, this is what I was going to say. Salam! 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 Cut! 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 <sighs> Finally, I get my own screen time again. Thank God. And so we invested in new equipment to bring you even better production with new songs and new singers and animations. Well, 
here are a few clips. And Sound Vision has brought all this into your home, making Islamic values and teachings easy. And if you know me, Adam, a multi-talented actor, <laughs> well, sometimes I'm an actor and, and the reporter and the... Oh, that's enough. Let's move on to the next section. Well, you can watch these new episodes on our new app at www.adamsworldapp.com. We have previews happening every day on Muslim Network TV. Sound Vision has been serving generations, moving and changing with the times. We are all faithfully connected. That is a huge blessing. Your donation helps keep these programs available now and into the future. We take this job of helping tomorrow's Muslims today seriously, and you should too. Today, we need your help. Children absorb and learn from everything they encounter. Make that wholesome, positive, grounded in our faith, Together, we can accomplish our goal of raising better Muslims, better neighbors, and better citizens. Please donate generously. It's an investment in our future. But to finish, let me tell you there are new scripts of my new mission. And it is something that I enjoy talking about. My new mission is Hey! Houston, we do not have a problem! <laughs> Salam! See you soon! Welcome back to Muslim Network TV. This is Imam Malik Mujahid, and I'm talking with an independent journalist, <coughs> excuse me, Ford Fisher, who covered uh, January 6th events uh, in the Washington, D.C. So let's, I mean, we will talk a little more about the challenges of what uh, independent media uh, faces as compared to the mainstream media, they have their own challenges as well. But let's focus on January 6th events. So you, you feel that most of the mainstream media underestimated what is possible, uh, but you somehow had the feel that it is going to accelerate into what, it ha what actually happened. Why were you watching certain media and looking into 
uh, some website or some how, how did you have this feel that it is going to be much more than another uh, a third uh, mega rally right i mean i think that there was a difference in the fact that president trump himself was promoting it and i think that at the previous rallies uh, pe- the the mainstream media kind of seemed to be covering them during the events, uh, but largely uh, not attempting to follow around kind of the roving violence as much at night. So I think the mainstream media, in a way, may have been left faultily with the impression that uh, not as much violence was occurring at these things, and they were more focused on Trump himself. I think that if there's anything the last four years have taught us, it's that the mainstream media is obsessed with Donald Trump, <laughs> for better or for worse. And I'm not I saying that they... It goes both ways. Uh, and President Trump is obsessed with the mainstream that's, media. That's true as well. He definitely spends a lot of time, uh, or at least in the White House, he spent a lot of time watching the news, uh, seeing what people say about him. And that meant uh, a lot to him. And so there was this a uh, strange relationship, be it parasitic or symbiotic, but uh, Trump and the media, uh, in a way, needed each other. And so I think that the mainstream media's narrative, the main thing that they were focused on about the previous two events was, look, President Trump is uh, kind of causing so many people to believe this, and he's still not accepting the results of the election. So there was a lot of focus just on Trump and on Trump's own uh, elements of participation in those two events. So at the very first of the million MAGA marches, Trump had his motorcade basically go through the rally so that he could wave at people out of his uh, limo. And on the December, at the December event, he had Marine One, his helicopter, fly over the event. So the flyover was obviously kind of a nod to them. And so the media, I think, was really focused on uh, on the Trump angle of it, on the look what he's making his followers believe angle of it, and and then his the fact of his own um, words about denying the election results. I think that when it came to the uh, to the third of them, to the January sixth event, I think they were probably more focused on Trump's speech. Um, itself, right? Look at what Trump is saying and look at how many people he's brought. But I, it just doesn't seem like they were actually expecting there to be kind of a, a essentially a riot situation forming out of it. And to be honest, that ha- it hasn't really happened the tr- the, in, the, in the past before that. Trump supporters, for the most part, at these big events, and I'm not talking about the, the elements that would run around trying to fight people in the streets after them, but for the most part, at Trump events, what, be it like a Trump rally where Trump is speaking or whatever, there tends to be an inclination of Trump supporters to uh, sort of follow the police's orders. They definitely will say, we back the blue, we're law and order. Right. And so and there's this rhetoric about, oh, the left is the ones who, you know, participate in anti-government violence or whatever it is. And so I think that uh, the mainstream media just sort of based on kind of all narrative leading up to that in their sort of simple way of looking at it, there was no reason to think that it could turn into this. Um, For me, I saw very escalating rhetoric and the fact that in sort of Trump world, January 6th was seen as the last chance to do something about it, right? I think to most people in this country, you see the election happen. And you're like, well, the election's over. Everything else is a formality. For, for Trump supporters, they were looking at the certification in Congress of the electoral results. That for them was the actual sort of last chance. And so I think that for people who have been told by the president, be wild and the election is stolen. And then of course, at the speech, he said, uh, if we don't fight like hell, we're not gonna have a country anymore. I think that they heard what he was saying. And for them, they were interpreting that as we need to go and fight. So, you know, most media, of course, after the January 6th event uh, focused on that. But the rally before that uh, is in which President commanded them to go do that. There's not much discussion. Of course, uh, wherever there is a violence, uh, that is the news. But you were in that uh, uh, rally as well. And, Correct, uh, and you heard President commanding people to do that. What was people's feeling at that rally? I mean, uh, what did you sense? 
I think that the the interesting thing about the second rally was that it did bring a number of sort of high profile uh, participants to it. So Mike Lindell, who is uh, known as the My Pillow guy, uh, spoke at the second of the rallies, as well as General Michael Flynn, um, who I think people might not have assumed that. Um, you know, if, if you had said a few years ago that Michael Flynn would participate in a rally about overturning election results, I think most people would be pretty surprised by that. Um, but it was a little bit more disorganized, the second one. Um, it was actually broken into a few different factions. There wasn't one explicit time that Trump supporters were supposed to march. And so there was kind of a general meandering uh, toward the Capitol throughout the December event. The thing that actually ended up being more of the headline uh, type situation on uh, the December event was that at night, the Proud Boys again continued uh, roving throughout the city. And one of the things that they did, which I did capture on video and again, licensed to many of these major networks, um, the Proud Boys took a banner off of a uh, historically black church that said Black Lives Matter. They took it toward uh, Harry's Bar, which is a popular sort of conservative hangout spot in Washington, D.C., in the otherwise quite liberal Washington, D.C., and uh, they set it on fire, right? They poured um, lighter fluid on it, and they and they set this thing on fire. And they were being sought after that as the main, that was sort of the main law enforcement priority following the December event was we are seeking identity, you know, information about, and they were putting up faces of the people who set it on fire. And instead of ultimately arresting the actual people who set it on fire, Enrique Tario, the leader of the Proud Boys, uh, posted to Parler that he takes full responsibility, that he that he's the one who did it. Um, I was there. I watched very closely. Enrique Tario actually did not set it on fire with his own hands. He was actually holding a cup of coffee at the time, but he was there and he was their leader and he was clearly approving of what was going on. And so he sort of took the fall for it by uh, writing that online. And the other thing he wrote was, I'll do it again. And so when he returned on January 4th, ahead of the January 6th rally, um, he was arrested as soon as he entered Washington, D.C. And what he was charged with was uh, destruction of, of property under $1,000 of value. Um, he wasn't technically charged with a hate crime, although that could still be coming. Um, and he was also charged for the fact that he was in possession of two rifle magazines at the time. Um, what was interesting about that was that he was actually banned from Washington, D.C. It's a pretty unusual term uh, for a judge to include as a term of release, right? Usually it's you can't make contact with the victim, you know, whatever. But the logic that the judge used was he said he would do it again. And there's Black Lives Matter stuff all over Washington, D.C. So none of Washington, D.C. can be safe is what the judge asserted. And so he's only allowed to return to Washington, D.C. for court matters. But the other interesting thing about the Proud Boys, so their leadership, their like their their top guy, the chairman, was banned from D.C. to you know the day before the event. This court hearing happened on the fifth. He was he was arrested on the fourth. Court hearing on the fifth. The the insurrection happened on the sixth. The other thing was that he had posted to Parler saying we want the Proud Boys to be incognito this time. The Proud Boys are usually very easily recognizable by wearing uh, black outfits with gold rims on their um, on their shirts and so forth. So they're very, and, and logos. So they're extremely obvious who they are and they, they'll chant things like, proud of your boy, right? So everybody knows who they are, but they did it differently on January 6th. They said, we are gonna go incognito. We wanna be dressed in black. We wanna basically look the way that the left usually does at street events, like the black block tactics. And so that has really obscured our understanding of what their participation was. It would have been much easier uh, if they had all been wearing uniforms to say, oh, there was about 100 or 200 of them that did it. At this point, we don't know exactly, but some Proud Boys have been arrested, identified and arrested since then. But I thought it was pretty interesting that they had that tactical shift. And I think that there's essentially no reason they would do that if it was not for uh, the obvious possibility of conflict. Is that the reason some people have been saying that Antifa was there? I think that this was a really quick piece of disinformation that I have been trying to debunk as much as possible. 
because it's really generally shared in bad faith. So in some cases, people say, oh, there must have been Antifa because, look, they're, they're wearing masks, which is more of a leftist tactic, or they're wearing black, which is more common among leftists, or they have gas masks, or simply that they did violence and they associate that with the left. But in the when people have pointed out very specific examples of, we think this person is Antifa and here's our evidence, they've all been easily debunkable. So just to give very quick examples, there was a guy who wore uh, like horn Horns. He had like a helmet uh, with horns, like dressed like a Viking. And someone posted a photo saying this is him at a Black Lives Matter protest. So he must be a leftist. The, the photo was cropped to exclude his sign, but he was actually holding a sign at this BLM protest that said Q sent me. He was counter protesting them. He was a he was a Trump, a conspiracy theorist and a Trump supporter. There was another example. There was a person who facial recognition software picked up and linked him to an Antifa website. This guy's photo is at the Capitol. There's a picture of this guy at the Capitol and there's a picture of this guy on an Antifa website. And they said, so he's Antifa. Antifa doesn't post pictures of themselves onto their websites. They post pictures of right-wingers they're identifying. So if you actually look at the context of it, it was a photo of him with an avowed neo-Nazi <laughs> and, uh, and it's posted on an Antifa website in order to like expose this person or claim that there's something wrong with this person, you know, whatever. And so people were are using these sort of um, not genuine arguments to try to make that uh, claim. I will say, in fairness, there was one individual named John Sullivan who participated, who has previously been arrested at uh, Black Lives Matter riots as a participant, but well before the Capitol insurgency, the Antifa organizations and Black Lives Matter organizations have all disavowed him and put out public warnings. Don't let this person near your your events because he's an instigator. He always makes it, you know, more violent or something. And so, so far, that's the only example of an infiltrator that I've seen who has any real connection to the left. But at the same time, the left has disavowed him uh, months ago. So this is just somebody who's generally a bad actor who generally shows up to things to ham up violence for whatever reason. Uh, but is not somebody who would neatly be uh, affiliated with the left or the right. So uh, looking at your footage, it seems that sometime uh, you were close to the door, but at one time you were probably inside uh, the Capitol Dome as well. Uh, so no, I personally did not go inside the Capitol. I kind of, my, my limit was that I basically went up to the door that people were going in and out of the Capitol on the East Front, and I zoomed in pretty tightly. So some of the shots you would see almost, almost maybe would look like I'm inside of it. But no, I, I personally didn't go in. And my reasoning was that honestly, I, I have a Capitol Hill press credential. I think that the the way that they breached the outside, I think it would be reasonable for any journalist to follow. I certainly admire many journalists who had sort of the bravery to go inside. And, but for me, it felt like, um, you know, this is a place, the, the Capitol is a place that I film uh, for work normally. And the idea of just going in and bypassing security during part of a riot, it just felt, it felt like too much for me as somebody who's uh, sort of a member of the of the uh, Capitol Hill press. You're watching Muslim Network TV. This is Imam Malik Mujahid, and we're talking about January 6th event from a from an eyewitness who's independent journalist, Ford Fisher. And we'll be right back after these messages. My wife, who uh, 
she's a professor at the University of Cincinnati who, who's Catholic. And by her watching and listening to our three-year-old son uh, watch Adam's World, she ended up taking Kalima Shahada. She embraced Islam because she learned so much about Islam and the other prophets. It really affected our life in a great way. And because of uh, Sound Vision and Adam's World, we're Muslims. I took my Shahada 15 years ago, and I actually am from a rural part of Ohio. And so I found the catalog for Sound Vision, and I ordered the the tapes and the CDs and the books and I use those and especially for my little daughter you know that's how we basically learned our Islam and Islam entered our hearts through the wonderful works of, of Sound Vision. Hey Assalamu alaikum brother I just want you to know that I love the Sound Vision website that a lot of times when I'm looking for information especially as it relates to homelessness domestic violence and women issues I go to that website and then I see what you've written and then I copy and paste it and spread the word because the wisdom is there so I can't you know, I can't do any better than what Sound Vision has already done. Sound Vision is our survival uh, uh, guide. It is the uh, organization that provides skills for Muslims how to survive and thrive in this uh, community here in the U.S. Assalamu alaikum, my name is Anam, I'm in 11th grade and I grew up with Adam's World and what it taught me was unity, respect and love for the Muslim Ummah. Is Adam's World is the greatest show ever made. Take me to the Kaaba, man. I love that puppet. Welcome back to Muslim Network TV. This is Imam Malik Mujahid. I'm talking with an independent journalist, Ford Fisher. Uh, Ford, when you were covering, uh, you know, I see your footage, there were a whole lot of people with good cameras out there, not just cell phone, which were, you know, people who were, uh, you know, there and using their own cell phone to uh, take footage, but there seems to be some other professional camera some people have uh, quite a bit of equipment there uh, as coverage. So were they were all independent journalists or what was going on? Are some of the writers themselves? Um, so I think that a lot, a lot of the protesters were, uh, or insurgents or whatever you would want to call them, but the, a lot of them used cell phones, uh, were recording these moments. And I thought it was actually really interesting to see that some of them were taking selfies. I thought that this was actually really fascinating, like sociologically, uh, that some of them seemed, uh, to be really feeling like what they were doing didn't even feel illegal to them, right? There were, I saw people, you know, take selfies with smiling next to broken windows and things like that. But um, for the most part, I wouldn't think that uh, the actual participants would have professional uh, cameras, but at the same time, people who had, you know, CNN logo, something like that would certainly not have been able to get where I got. I, I was an, I'm an independent journalist. I think that s some of these people are probably familiar with my work and they know that my work uh, is raw footage and live stream. And so it just shows what happens. And so activists usually are pretty proud of what they're doing. And so uh, they would be likely to uh, sort of attack a, a CNN reporter or something if they had shown up there uh, and say, you know, we feel that those people are going to like make us look bad, but they know I'm just going to basically show what happened. And I think that there's other independent journalists, photographers and so forth uh, who are able to film in that way as well. I would note that uh, later in the very video that you're showing, I, um, after the Capitol building had been cleared out, but before the Capitol sort of property, like the lawn was cleared out, the uh, protesters turned, the, some of them turned their attention to, there's kind of a media area. There's an area that people set up tripods that are sort of always filming uh, near the Capitol, not just during an event, but they're kind of always prepared in case there's going to be a congressperson who wants to say something or whatever. And they went toward the media friend uh, yelling things like, we're the news now. 
and they basically ran at them and uh, physically attacked some of those uh, media people. The journalists mostly fled with the cameras in hand, but they left behind a lot of broadcasting equipment, basically live stream equipment, or not, I shouldn't say live stream, but like live broadcasting equipment for the networks, uh, lighting equipment, tripods and stuff. And people basically just picked that stuff up and threw it on the ground, threw it around and essentially just destroyed it. Um, so there certainly was no love for the mainstream media out there, although how do you uh, independent journalists like me were not targeted as much. How do, you, how do you differentiate yourself as an independent journalist as compared to the professional journalists? I think that it's largely just about the actual name on the credential. So, I mean, I wear my credential. It says news to share. So in addition to the fact that, you know, some people might actually recognize me, but, uh, you know, if I show my credential and they say new, see news to share, it's an independent outlet, right? It's different from, uh, you know, if someone shows their credential and it says CNN, they're like, nope, that's no good, right? And what's unfortunate is that, you know, camera people are camera people, right? If someone, I've seen this happen as well at, um, you know, left-leaning events, not saying that it's gotten super violent, but like individual camera people have been worked out based on the fact that they're that their credential, it says Fox 5, like they're like they're for a local Fox station. It doesn't mean that they're conservative bias. The local, you know, networks are really kind of just that local networks. Um, but so sometimes it's kind of just based on people's perception of the affiliation they see on the credential. But uh, my outlet news to share uh, I think to most people would either have the reputation of being objective, uh, which I tr aspire to make it be, uh, or they have no opinion of it all at all because they haven't heard of it. And uh, neither of those would be reasons for somebody to physically attack me. Hmm. So did somebody ask you who you are, why you're filming? That, that happened a couple of times. Um, but uh, there was actually, there was one situation that was sort of funny, like an individual uh, kind of went up to me and was asking like, what do you, like, what do you do? You know, whatever. And um, what I just, I described my outlet and that the fact that it was like basically objective. And I was like, it's got, you know, some Trump supporters follow it, but some other people follow it. And he's like, so it's not all Trump supporters. Like he was like, his, he, was, he didn't like attack me. He didn't make a problem out of it. It was like almost a joke, but um, but literally like the inclination was like, oh, so you're not actually pro Trump media, right? Like, and that was kind of like, uh oh, right. So, uh, yeah, the, the footage that you're showing on the screen is the exact situation I was talking about where, uh, this is basically moments after most of the journalists fled, but everything you see them destroying there, uh, is professional broadcast equipment owned by the networks yeah, and probably they just smashed it. hundreds of thousands of dollars there. I, I would say so. Yeah. Yeah. Were you, uh, when you were doing that, you can see there are other people who are filming that. And That's some right. of them have professional cameras. Yeah, I think that the, uh, to be honest, like the way that people target the media is often not like based in rationality. <laughs> um, <laughs> right. So, I mean, I don't think anybody should be attacked for having a camera. I think that it's First Amendment protected speech. I think especially people who call themselves conservatives or say they care about the Constitution should be, uh, you know, pretty focused on that. But um, with that being said, you know, it does. It's. I think that their, their, like, their inclination was probably to attack people who looked like they had actual sort of broadcast video cameras as opposed to like if it's DSLR to take photos. They're not as worried about people taking still photos. Um, they, there was a still photographer, I think who was with Associated Press, who basically got physically dragged around and like thrown like out. And it was just because he was wearing a black jacket and black jeans. And so I think people assumed that he was an, or not, I think it was obvious. People assumed that he was like an Antifa person. Like it was literally just the way he was dressed, even though it was an Associated Press photographer. He was no different than any other photographer there. Mm -hmm. In fact, probably more professional than, than many of them. I think AP is probably considered the creme de la creme of professional photography. Uh, and yet that person was thrown out basically just because of the color of their jacket. Um, so it, it lacks reason, I think. Tell me, let us move a little towards uh, what is the difference between an independent journalist and a citizen journalist? Mm -hmm. but, oh, between an independent versus a citizen journalist? I mean, I think mm -hmm. that these words are probably fairly malleable. I guess I probably wouldn't use the term citizen journalist to describe me in the sense that I have made like a business uh, out of it. I do hire uh, freelancers. So I, I see the distinction as that between citizen, like 
corporate media and technically I have, I am incorporated, but I wouldn't call myself corporate media in the same way. Like, uh, 90% of what you see on television is owned by six different corporations. And so I think of that really as the bundle of corporate media when it's kind of in that landscape. So I think of independent citizen journalism, whatever, as uh, the or and freelancers also as the people who are working while not employed by essentially those gigantic uh, behemoths of uh, media organizations. As far as citizen journalism, I mean, I really do believe in my heart anybody can be the media. And this has been a complicated you know, problem because all it takes is this, right? If you have an iPhone uh, or, or Samsung or whatever else, uh, then you're capable of live streaming something. And so you're entitled to the same rights of free press as somebody who has a, you know, a press credential. I wear my credential to identify myself. And I think that it, it helps, uh, you know, people, be it police or be it participants in something to know who I am uh, and understand that I'm legitimate. But at the same time, uh, the right to film is not endowed by having a press credential. The right to film is uh, inherent in, I would say, our humanity, but it's at least inherent in uh, the First Amendment. Ford, you mentioned somewhere, I think, in, in the Fox interview or someplace, uh, there is a level of age discrimination you felt. Did you say age discrimination? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that uh, in some ways, um, you know, I well, I think that it's probably more related to whether somebody is affiliated with a mainstream network. I think the thing that I've been pointing out to, uh, you know, Fox and, and so forth is that YouTube has taken took down my video of the president speaking on January 6th, basically the whole speech that led up to everything. But the same speech is fully watchable on news network platforms that are owned by those corporations that I just mentioned. So like a local NBC, a local CBS station, their their videos of the same speech are up and monetized, whereas my video from inside the crowd showing the crowd reacting as Trump gives that speech, mine was removed as inappropriate. I think that that kind of discrimination is against, yeah, independent content creators, um, as opposed to people who have the backing of those large corporations. I'm not sure how much I would connect it to age. If I, if I, at my own age, I'm 26, if I were to go work at a uh, mainstream news network, I'm not sure that my content would be, uh, you know, lessened because of that. But I, I think that the, probably the, the inequality of the way of, of outcome in the way that they do content moderation is probably mostly based in, in that corporate backing. You know, in today's technology, everyone who has the iPhone or something like that can do uh, with a little bit of compromise in quality and uh, how the framing of the shot is. Uh, and, and, and that's where the whole field of, uh, you know, uh, user contributed uh, uh, footage and user contributed, uh, what is the term about, there is a term about that, yeah, user user-generated content. Right. Uh, so uh, don't you think there is, a, there is a struggle for an independent journalist to differentiate from the user-generated content? Yeah, I mean, and I do think that that's something where credentialing makes a difference. And honestly, having a, uh, a roster of look at all of the places that my work uh, has been can make a difference, right? So being able to say my work has been in four Emmy winning documentaries, uh, you know, I'm credentialed by the White House and Congress, right? All of those sorts of things definitely make a difference when it comes to access. But in terms of social media, honestly, I don't think that it's really uh, helped that much, right? I have, in spite of all of those things, Twitter has still marked me as a sensitive profile altogether, and YouTube still demonetized me, although they fixed it in one day, and they still took down my Trump video, uh, which they still have not restored at all, right? So, you know, that sort of thing seems to indicate to me, I guess, that the big tech giants, basically, if you don't have the, the words Fox, CNN, NBC, MSNBC, whatever, you know, at the end of your email address, then uh, you're not in the cool guys club <laughs> as far as the tech giants are concerned. You know, you're just a couple of people there. In, in your website, at least in the team listed, there are you and plus two other people. Uh, how, how then, uh, you know, White House and Congress mm -hmm. will give you credentials? Uh, is it because you incorporated an entity or you have to prove that, hey, I have covered this, I have covered that? How, how does that process work? Because, you know, there could be many more people like yourself who could get into this. 
Right. So as far as congressional uh, credentials, the organization is credentialed. So new, it's news to share. And then I'm able as the editor in chief of news to share to to issue them. Um, and that's basically based on being able to establish that you've been able to professionally cover uh, the organization. So I don't want to go too deeply into it, like the RTCA and how that stuff works. Uh, but in short, basically, you get you can get the credential, and there's generally a six month probationary period during which uh, they will evaluate whether you actually are doing professional journalism. And if somebody was misusing the congressionally issued pr credential in some way, then they wouldn't let you keep it. Um, so my work is professional, I think, by the standard of anybody who actually watches it. The problem is only uh, social media giants and so forth, uh, like YouTube and Twitter and sometimes Facebook, that have uh, that ju that just say, well, this isn't a giant corporation, and so we can treat them in a different way. Um, but anybody who and and I think that that's largely sort of robotic or or based on inference without actually looking at the work. But I don't think anybody who actually looks at my work would then take issue to it, uh, given that it's all just raw content and it's always for the purpose of licensing to larger outlets, which I do frequently. It's the it's the method of what my business is, right? So on any given video, I can say, well, this was used by BBC, and that that was actually the case with the. The exact video that YouTube took down of mine recently that I've been fighting them about, uh, BBC used that exact same footage, and their documentary that uses that footage is still on YouTube. So, how many other small operation of independent media are out there in Washington DC? Oh my goodness, uh, many, many, many of them. So I think that I am unique in the sense that I do this full time. I find that a lot of independent journalists tend to have other jobs because frankly, it's hard to make it work uh, as a complete business. Um, but when I go to events, I certainly often see uh, other independent journalists who are, uh, you know, the same people showing up at different events, right? And so, hi, John, or hi, what, you know, whoever, right? Uh, that people who do sort of similar to what I do uh, show up at things sort of all the time. Um, I think, like I just said, the difference is probably uh, that I'm able to to do so full time. So I spend a lot of time doing that. I get to go to more events. And I have been able to make enough relationships with the mainstream media and licensing them and so forth that I've actually been able to afford to hire people when there are large events that I'm not able to cover for whatever reason, such as if I'm already covering something else. So what about, uh, you know, to deal with the uh, social media giants, uh, Twitter, YouTube, and Facebook, uh, you guys come up with the association of independent media and enter into communication with them that what is your model and how uh, they're disrupting it and how you're helping uh, in the fulfillment of the First Amendment. Yeah, some friends and I actually have kind of come up with ideas like that, like let's associate the independent media together, let's make an organization of it, to sort of unionize in a way might be a way to put it. But it has been really hard to sort of keep a cohesive structure like that. Um, and it's hard to really get the attention of the of these tech giants when, you know, <laughs> even if you band together uh, a number of independent journalists, you're still not even close to the behemoth of corporate dollars that the... Of that course, the you will never have. be. But, but so it's very hard to get their attention. For example, if Fox News is covering you, mm -hmm. they can get a statement from the Independent Journalist Association that right. this continue to happen to our uh, uh, journalists. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, you need to f fix as a systemic thing instead of just, okay, just banning one, restoring the other and things like that. So there will be an additional voice uh, which will be out there protecting, <clears throat> which I think is going to be a continuously growing field of independent journalists because the mainstream media <laughs> Excuse me, cutting down the staff. And one of the person who used to work for me, uh, she's working for ABC News, and now she is exactly like you. She is um, getting her own story, recording her stories, editing her stories, and mm -hmm. reporting her own stories. Uh, right. Is that the new norm? And say, yeah, that's what they you have to do now. So, so it seems the discipline which you're in, independent journalist, will continuously growing. And it is in the interest in many, many other aspects, not just dealing with the major social media, that that voice is articulated properly. 
Yeah, I I would like to think so. It's di- it like I said, it is difficult to organize against. Uh, it's sort of a David and Goliath kind of story. But uh, I mean, you would see in those Fox stories. I have spent a lot of my time advocating about this, saying, you know, even though I got remonetized after Fox News wrote these stories about me, I'm still trying to speak out for other people who got demonetized at the same time. And it did happen literally at the same time. We've looked at the emails that we got demonetizing my channel as well as some other people that I that I know, and they were all sent to exactly 12 52 p.m on the same day like like simultaneously it happened to all of us and so uh even if it's sort of an informal association i do think it's important that uh independent content creators stand up for one another well thank you so much for i mean you you're sort of adventurous yourself and venturing into all of that and thank you for your contribution and thank you so much for being with us you bet. Thank you for having me. Ward Fisher is an independent news uh, distributor, newstoshare.com. His work has uh, been included in four Emmy Award winning films and major media uh, tapped into his resources. So thank you so much, Ward Fisher. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, you Sherdil Khan, for booking Sherdil uh, Ford Fisher. And thank you, Dr. Abdul Wahid, for producing today's show. And thank you for watching. Muslim Network TV is there 24 7. So stay tuned for other programming. We're on Galaxy 19 Satellite, Apple TV, Amazon Fire TV, Raku, as well as uh, on our own app, which you can download on any platform or check out our website, muslimnetwork.tv. Peace. Salam.